not me. Okay, I can I can stand it. I, I think that's a good illustration of what it's like to be an author. There's a um, anybody that follows me on social media knows that my wife and I go to the South Pacific for a couple of months every year. Uh, it sounds snootier than it is. We have friends there, and so we get a we get a smoking deal on where we stay. But we we go to the island of Rarotonga, which is part of the Cook Islands. Which wonderful, wonderful people. They speak with these beautiful Kiwi accents, which. The character in my book, Lola Te Ariki, um, Te Ariki is a Maori, particularly a Cook Island name. Um, but they have a saying in Cook Island Maori, it's a proverb, and the question is asked by an elder, what's the most important thing in the world? And then the elder answers the question for the young person, hetangata, hetangata, hetangata. It means it's the people, it's the people. It's the people. And I think no matter whether you're writing fantasy novels or adventures or whatever, law enforcement's a people business, and it gives us a chance to really, I mean, my I grew up in the Adam-12 era. I'm a bit older than you. And the thing that I really loved about those shows is that they studied human nature. And my youngest son, our youngest son, is a police officer now. And he told me one time, um, he's a SWAT guy. I mean, he's very good at his job. And I thought, you know, he got in this line of work because of the cool adventure. And he said, he got in this line of work because of the stories about my friends that I told around the dinner table and that camaraderie, which is kind of cool. I like that that's the, that's the reason he got into the, the gig. Yeah, I grew up in the Chips era with the California Highway Patrol Chips show. You remember that one? I do indeed. That made policing look like a fantasy world. Um, yeah, and then, uh, they, had cool, they had cool revolvers. I was I was a police officer during that time, and I was happy because they still carried revolvers like I did. And then the, the show that I really got into, though, was, um, and I was pretty young, probably too young to be watching it, really, was Hill Street Blues. I don't know if you yeah, remember yeah. that one. I do. I really yeah. liked that. Show, yeah. I, I, that that affected the, the, I don't know, the, the atmosphere of police. I, I, I never saw a police officer wear a ball cap until Hill Street Blues came out. Yeah. Yeah. And then so as an fun. adult, I started watching um, The Wire. Of course, mm-hmm. I already worked at the prison at this time, and The Wire was the closest I had seen to cops being real cops on yeah, no. The Wire constantly gets good reviews. It's funny, my son and I chat all the time when we talk about what's the most, what's to the everyday world, what's the, you know, your everyday work, what's law enforcement, or what show is most like law enforcement in real life, and we... We both vote for Brooklyn Nine Nine because it's it's really not all. It's there's a lot of cutting up and camaraderie yeah. and stuff like that with this. In fact, there's an episode on Brooklyn Nine Nine called "Show Me Going," where Rosa is headed to some violent, and they all think she's been killed. And it's it's a funny show, but that particular episode is probably the most like real because something bad's going on. I can't remember a shooting or something, and all these people all over. New York are saying, show me going, show me going. In my in my department, we would say, attach me, attach me, attach me. Uh, and they say, show me going. But that's a very, for, so for such a slapstick comedy show, that particular episode is really a gut well, punch. Speaking of, speaking of camaraderie between officers, uh, a lot of times when I do those YouTube reviews of books, I'll try to kind of poke fun of different things that I read in the book a little bit. And the first thing I poked fun of in your book was when the officer joked that his partner's name sounded like a stripper name. Oh yeah. And, right. uh, and, and his, and his, uh, and Arliss Cutter pulled him aside and said, Hey, we don't talk to each other like that. I, I, I kind of joked about that. Cause I was like, that's not even a really a bad joke. <laughs> it's not no, even it's not. It's not. So it was a, tell yeah, me about. a well. I was the chief when I started writing that, and in this day and age, you don't put up with anything. You really don't. And even though I, it's one of those things where 
you might even have made that kind of a joke in your own life. And I, I've got friends and people I worked with that were a blast to work with, but I would hate to supervise them. And <laughs> plus, I wanted to show that I wanted to show that Arliss was a bit of a, a bit of a you know might have had a little bit of a stick up his hind end. He was. He was getting the lay of the land. He's not going to put up with any crud. And as you go on, you realize he really is kind of a damaged dude. Um, and uh -huh. he doesn't put up with anything. He doesn't put up with... So he considers her more like his niece or his daughter than, yeah. than uh, anything else. So I wouldn't let somebody tell my daughter that. I'd probably get along with my... Uh, <laughs> I might, except that would be my last name, right? So... Yeah, I just I, I I poked fun of that scene just oh, because yeah. I've I've, pro I've probably I've probably been there and heard worse. <laughs> oh, I've heard I've heard way worse. I've said worse. I mean, that's just yeah. But oh. that's the other thing. Arliss is Arliss is not me. So I guess we have some questions over here. Do you want to? I got to get my glasses. Well, right. the first one's for you. I don't know if you want to okay. read that one. Yeah. So says, Mark, are there incidents that you have experienced in your career that are so sensitive that you cannot write about them in your books? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really careful. Uh, because I had a, a, a top secret clearance in the Marshal Service, and there was some, I went to joint terrorism, you know, JTTF meetings, joint terrorism task force meetings, um, things about infrastructure, things like that. I tried to skirt around that. Also, the Marshal Service handles the witness protection program, and I'm very, um, I'm very careful. I get asked about it all the time. I'm part of a group called Cops and Writers that Patrick O'Donnell does on Facebook. Um, great, great program that uh, helps writers when they have questions about law enforcement. And I get a lot of questions about the Marshal Service, and probably half of them are about witness security, and I just it's just too sensitive. I still have friends in, on the job. Plus, my youngest son's still on the job and works with the with the marshal service as a police officer. So I'm I'm careful about that sort of that sort of thing. So yeah, and at the prison, we've got at the Utah State Prison, we've got some pretty famous inmates that have had movies made about them, and even HBO series like mm -hmm. Mark Hoffman, who was the forger that blew people up with right. the bombs. The Mormon Murder uh, series that HBO did, and now, right now, under the banner of Heaven, is oh, yeah. a big thing on Netflix, which is about the the Lafferty mur murders. And I get asked all the time, "Hey, you, do you know those guys? What are they like? This, that, and other?" And yeah, I know, I know those guys, but I don't, I don't tell people what no. I know about. I just say, yeah. "Yeah, they're there. They're 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 good inmates. They behave themselves." Mm -hmm. That's about all I say. Yeah, we we had a. I'm sure you read the the book Butcher Baker. You know the story about the serial killer in Alaska back in the 70s. And in fact, there's a show called On Frozen Ground or Frozen Ground, yeah, something like that. Might have been a YouTube thing I watched about that recently, but yeah, I mentioned that in the books. He was he's dead already, um, but um, generally, I don't write about real things. One thing that I think with Brian and, and I'm sure with Brian and I do too, I, having the experience doesn't mean we have to write about the experience, but we know what not to write and how to write, you know, where to look for uh, certain things that, that add to very interesting characters and, and things like that. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, that's probably the same thing. Uh, any of your characters based on family, friends, or fellow law enforcement officers. Very, I'm very careful not to base them on any one person, but they're certainly inspired by. I, early on, I'd written a Western, and it was a, there was a violent scene where the, the bad guy uses the guy's boot to vault into the saddle, and he, he bites the, or the good guy vaults in the saddle of the bad guy that's hurt his wife, and he bites his nose off. And... Um, Somebody said, they were reading my books, and they, somebody I knew from across the country said, man, I liked on page 56 where so-and-so bit that guy's nose, or that guy bit so-and-so's nose off. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not based on that 
that particular deputy, but I put enough in that they, in their mind, that's who I was writing about, was not so, was not so. How about that? You take the first, the next one, advice, Ryan. What advice do you have for aspiring mystery writers? Um, well, I'm an aspiring mystery writer, so I'd like to know. I mean, I've written fantasy novels and I've written one horror novel, but I want to delve into mysteries. I want to, my advice would be study great mystery writers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, Mark Cameron, read as many <laughs> mysteries. Well, read, read, uh, read, yeah, read Mark Cameron, Michael Connolly, Dennis Lehane, Robert Craze. Uh, I could I could name a hundred people. You should probably be reading and studying what they're doing. That's how I'm going to go about it, because I would like yeah. to write some mystery novels. But isn't but isn't every book a mystery? I mean, you, you're it's a question that's unanswered. Is the is the reader yeah. goes on so really it's just a milieu that that mystery happens in and i would say that my books are more we call them arliss cutter mysteries but really they're you know who the bad guys are you just don't know a few of the twists it's not a who done it kind of mystery it's more of a crime fiction where you get to as the reader help you know go along as arliss and lola kind of solve the crime or find the person or protect so and so, for, you know, protect this Supreme Court justice, just that sort of thing. Here's a this is an interesting question about about voice. Writing while working full time causes my voice to vary in longer novels. Any advice is how to keep your voice consistent when taking years to complete a book? Why don't you start there, Brian? Well, I still I work full time at the prison still. I work Monday through Thursday, 10 hours a day, and I do my writing strictly on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and I've been doing that since the year 2001. Uh, I don't know I, how to keep the voice consistent. I think, um, I don't know how long you go, how, how long of a stretch this person is going between writing. Like if you go six months, it's gonna take a, a minute or two to get back in the groove, I would expect. But I think as long as you stay consistent and keep at least do something at least once a week, that's I think good. you can manage. Yeah, um, that's true. Consistency is important. I think consistency is important just for creativity. You know, I can sit and feel like I'm just in a, in a, kind of in a funk. I can't, I, I can't, I can't figure out where I'm going. But as soon as I start writing, things sort of open up and my brain starts. So I write a lot longhand. I've got, beside me here, I've got one, two, three, four, five notepads that I'm working on the next Clancy. Um, one thing that I do, because I think, I think your voice is your voice. You're going to, what ha might happen is your execution of your voice. I mean, I can go back to my first Westerns years ago, and they're generally the same voice that I have now. Hopefully they're, you know, the books are better 22 books later. But one trick that you might try that I do on every book, I don't write the ending chronologically. In other words, I'll write the entire book up to the climax. So when it's when the fight happens on top of the, you know, in the cave or on the river or wherever, I stop and I go back and I edit the entire book. So I've built up a head of steam and I've caught the places that I've had to kind of fix when I got to the end. And so I my third draft, probably I'm running all the way through the book so that when I get to the end, the last chapters, I'm going and, and working my way through with the knowledge of how I've executed the whole thing and so I can fix those inconsistencies. All first drafts are crap, so you got to go back and fix them anyway, but that might really yeah, help. I, I don't think you find your voice in your first draft. I think your voice really gets added later in those subsequent drafts. I tell people, just write your book as fast as you can. Throw every idea that you ever had mm -hmm. into it. You can always edit that out. 
Yep. Because there, I throw every idea into my books that I think of at the time, and no matter how outlandish. Now, a lot of them stick. Some of them I reread, and I'm like, "What the hell was I thinking?" Um, and I just edit them out. It's no big deal. Um, no, that's but true. then my voice really starts to show up. But that way, you can get the draft out quickly. The story is there on the page, and then it doesn't seem like such a daunting task to go back and re-edit it and then re-edit that, and then re-edit that. And by the time your fourth or fifth polish is in place, that's when your voice really starts to shine through, at least for me. No, that's, everybody's different, but that's, that's certainly good advice, very good advice. I think this is the same person due to, okay, sometimes they have to skip working on a particular story for months. Yeah, and that, that's when going back and starting over and sort of playing i love words and so when i go back i kind of enjoy now once it's published i don't like going back and reading my stuff but while it's in the because i'm working on something new but while i'm working on it i really spend a lot of time in fact i'll write as i said almost to the end and then i'll go back and i'll spend a lot of time on that first chapter or two particularly the first paragraph and the first sentence I'll go into a bookstore like the King's English or when I'm in Salt Lake or, or really any bookstore and just read the first lines of book after book after book. Ken Follett was and is a master of, of the first line. He sets up that hook that makes you want to go further. And let's face it, in this day and age, when everybody wants an immediate, you know, get, you know gamers, that compulsion loop, We've got to get immediate gratification because of what we're used to online. That, you have to hook your reader right away. And that's not something that happens by chance. It takes craft. And many times I'll write three chapters before I get to the first sentence of the book. But I had to write those three chapters. So there's another question here I didn't want to skip. Oh, it says, Mark, I started with a advanced readers copy of cold snap and i'm catching up with one two and three how long before book five is out a year so book five is called breakneck it's done but in the editorial process um and i'm working on a, a another clancy right now so they're, they're about a year between books hey are you gonna ever set any of your um arliss cutter novels in fairbanks uh, Only because I lived there. <laughs> yeah, we well, you know part of Cold Snap, the, the rescue operation starts out of Fairbanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Some yeah. Stuff at Fox and all of that. And then Breakneck actually has a um, probably the first quarter, well, the middle, after the police scene in the beginning, there's a, a, a judicial conference that happens up in Fairbanks. So, yeah. This has been really good. This has been really good. Thank you guys for the questions, too. I think we're winding down here, it looks like. And I'll come back on screen now. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and this has been fascinating, and it's fun to get a perspective from from two different people in two different places with some, some uh, different unique ideas. Thank you both very much. Thank uh, you. We want to thank everybody that's joined us tonight and remind you to please take a moment and click on the green box at the bottom of the screen, uh, which is a link back to our website where you can buy copies of uh, Mark's and Brian's books. Uh, also on kingsenglish.com, there's information about upcoming events. We're happy to report that we're back in person. Mark Cameron, next time you're in town, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna host you in person. And uh, the, I think the event that I'd like to tell this audience about is Jack Carr, who will be here on the 26th, uh, which is a um, a Thursday for his new mystery thriller called In the Blood. So please uh, consider if you're in the neighborhood, or even if you're not in the neighborhood, come on down. Hey, Jack, Jack I, I, is a good I will, dude. Be there for, I will be there for that one. I love Jack Carr. Good. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good friend of mine. He is a, we've kind of like you and I were talking about Chris earlier. He and I have signed books together. So we're, he's a good dude. Very good. So that's Thursday the 26th of May? Thursday the 26th at 6 o'clock down here on the King's English patio. 
Yeah, yeah we're I excited. Mean, we we got him at the last minute after his tour, uh, so they extended his tour just for us. So we're really thrilled yeah. to have him. Everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, keep on reading, keep on wondering, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great night.